Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Take your Bibles, look with me to the book of Hebrews and the seventh chapter. Hebrews chapter number seven. And we're going to open back up right where we left off. As a matter of fact, this is kind of part B uh, of the last message that I preached uh, from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number seven. When we were on vacation this past summer, um, <clears throat> about the first week we were down there, actually the first day or two after we arrived, uh, we were on our way to dinner and uh, I noticed that the low pressure light, the low tire pressure light came on my car. And so we found a spot that was still open. It was kind of almost closing time for most places and peeled in over there and I said, my, air, my tire needs some air in it. It's going flat, I must have picked up a nail or something. And so um, he took the car around to the back and then about 10 minutes later, the mechanic came in and rolling that tire uh, into the waiting room where we were and he said, Mr. Whitson, um, I, I'm sorry to say you, you didn't need just some air in your tire and he showed me that the tire had completely worn out on the inside. Looked good on the outside, but the inside was just totally, he says, your tire is going to have to be replaced. Well, Next day or two after that, uh, Kathy was in one of those stores that they leave their husbands in the parking lot. And I was in the parking lot um, with the car running. It was really, really hot late afternoon. And uh, all of a sudden, all of the lights on my dash just started flashing and flashing and on and off. And I thought, what in the world is going on? I was only about five minutes away from that same tire store and that they also did mechanic work. I called Kathy real quick and I said, you need to get out of here. This, something's going on. I don't know what it is. And so that saved me a little money from that store. But anyway, we, 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 got, we got over to that mechanic's shop and uh, he came back in and he said, well, Mr. Witzel, we found your problem. It says your alternator has to be replaced. Um, today I want to talk to you about the great replacement. In chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews, he is talking about uh, the marks of the priesthood where Christ has become the replacement of the Old Testament high priest. Now I want to talk about these marks for just a few minutes through the rest of chapter 7 and then the beginning of chapter number eight. Now the first thing that I want you to see with me this morning is a needed priesthood. Now in the Old Testament, the priesthood was a picture or a symbol of perfection or a symbol of completeness. Now the only problem was it never did finish what it came to do. It was, it, it was never capable of doing the perfect. It was never capable of doing the complete. Watch with me, if you will, at verse number 12. For the priesthood being changed, and you could use the word replaced there, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now, there were two reasons why that this priesthood was not complete. And uh, first of all, it was never intended to be complete. And then secondly, uh, perfect access or perfection meant to the Jewish mind that they had access unto God. In the Levitical priesthood, the Jew never really had access to God. Animal sacrifices could never give the person a perfect standing uh, with God, nor direct access. So there had to be a change occur, the change in the priesthood. In order for that to happen, there had to be a change in the law. Now let me explain this, if I could, by giving you a little modern day example. If um, Donald Trump, our president, 
wanted to be a king over America rather than the president in America. Uh, you have to understand that our Constitution is not set up nor written that there could be a monarchy set up. Uh, so there would have to be a law changed in order for that to transpire. In order for the priesthood to change, there had to be a law changed. And that law was changed the very moment that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Now, Seventh-day Adventism and Adventism in itself would do its best to try to drag us back under the law. But I know that that's a trip that none of you ever really uh, want to make. Uh, you, you understand in Colossians 2, the Bible says that the law was nailed to the cross with Jesus. In Romans chapter 10 verse 4, the Bible says that Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Now I've got some good news for you here this morning. Nobody in the building, no one here this morning is under the law. As a matter of fact, I could even expand that for you. There's nobody in the world today that is still under the law. Pick it up now in verse number 13, if you will. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Now, you see that the priesthood of Jesus was a needed priesthood uh, because it was changed, the law was changed at the right time by a, and the right place by a sovereign God. Now, not only was it a needed priesthood, it is a different priesthood, not just one that was recycled, but that it was made different. Watch this in verse 15. And it is yet far more evident that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. Now here's the deal. Listen carefully. In the Old Testament, every priest was raised up not on the basis of his character, not on the basis of his morality, not on the basis of his good conduct. But a high priest was made a high priest after his lineage after the tribe that he came from. In other words, Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi. They had to come from the tribe of Levi to be a legitimate candidate for the high priest. Uh, so so you, you understand, it, they could have been a scoundrel for all practical purposes and still be eligible for the high priest simply because of their name, simply because of their lineage. Now, under the new covenant, under the new priesthood, uh, Jesus, uh, you, you understand, his chosen uh, part of being a high priest was not on the basis of character, but on the basis of his indestructible life. So it's changed dramatically. Look at verse 17, if you will. We're, we're going now in chapter 7. For he testifieth, thou art priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof. Now, here's the deal. These words really strike a, 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 a blow to the Jews. Now, when we're reading it, we're reading verses like this. Matter of fact, it's one of the great challenges of preaching through Hebrews. When you read this stuff, these words kind of blow in and they kind of blow out. But boy, when the Jews read this, it, it absolutely flabbergasted them. It floored them. It shocked them and stunned them uh, by the words. You, you understand what uh, the word says here by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit breathed into the writer of Hebrews. He says the law was weak and the law was really useless. But let me clear the air here for a minute. The Bible is very clear that the law was good in that it carried out what it was intended to do. It pulled off what it was intended to do. And that was it showed sin 
to be sin. It was never intended to bring people into a right relationship with God any more than the priest could bring people into a right relationship to God. It just brought people to the point that they could acknowledge their sin. In other words, look at verse number 19. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. You understand, what he's saying here in verse 19 is that Jesus is the perfect access that we have to God. Go over with me to Romans chapter 8. I want you to see a passage with me. Romans chapter uh, number 8 and begin reading with me in verse number 1. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no mortgage or lien on those uh, which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now watch this. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, remember he told us over there in the book of Hebrews that it was weak and useless. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Look down at verse 9. For we are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Go back to chapter 5. Look at verse number 1. Chapter 5, verse 1, same book of Romans. Therefore, being justified by faith, We have peace with God. How? Through the law? No. Couldn't do it. Useless. Profitless. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have access to God through Jesus. He is the only genuine, bona fide means by which any of us in this room can ever gain access to the very presence of God. God. And so the writer now in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's pleading with these Jews, don't go back into that old way of life. Don't go back into that old way of living. Don't go back into that old lifestyle that you were. It's not profitable for you. Isaac Watts penned it very well. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Third, it was a guaranteed priesthood. Now, I promise you, when I get through this third point, you will discover that it was worth all of the effort that you made this morning to get up out of the bed, get ready, and get to church at 930. You're going to notice that. Notice, if you will, verse number 20. We're back in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 20. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. I'm going to go on to verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath, but this was an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, you understand that God never made an oath over a priest in the Old Testament. Why? Because it was never to be permanent, it was to be temporary. So he comes along now and he makes an oath over Jesus that he is going to be the high priest forever uh, and ever. Now, this may not be a good time to mention it. It may not be a good time to bring it up. Uh, but I, only wanna, I, I won't delve into it too far. But, but I think it's worthy of mention this morning. Uh, we, we need a good message somewhere along the way on the sovereignty of God. Uh, It's a vast subject. And the reason I think we need that message is because oftentimes, most of the time, we operate our lives as if God were in the dark. I can prove it by our prayer life. Uh, Because we start out our prayer life as if we are informing God about something. You know, God is sovereign. And and you you don't inform God about anything. He is sovereign over your family. 
He is sovereign over your health. He is sovereign over your children. He is sovereign over your grandchildren. He is sovereign over every aspect of your life. And we need to be reminded of that. And we do him a disservice when we bring him down to some kind of anemic level that we think that we're informing God about what's going on around us. Maybe a better way to start our prayer life would be by saying, you know, God, I know you already know about what's going on in my life. You already know about my finances and you already know about my health and you already know about my kids. You already know about my job. You already know everything. And, and, and so God, but, but I just need to tell you about this because I need your help. I, I, you ever hear preachers pray sometimes? Preachers are the worst. I'm just telling you. I've, I've tried my best for 40-something years to guard against that stained glass voice that you hear oftentimes when a preacher starts praying, Oh, Lord God of the universe, come down among us and worship with us today. I want to get in the back of the auditorium and say, I'm already here, you big dummy. That, that's just a little carnal thing that I got going on in my life, you know. So if God says that Jesus is the high priest forever, guess what? He's the high priest forever. And this oath that he's making is not to verify his trustworthiness. It's we need to hear it. He doesn't need to say it, but we need to hear it. Look at verse 22. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, a better covenant, which using the word better implies that uh, something else was lesser. And so he's saying that the high priest of Christ is a whole lot better than the high priest of the Old Testament, if you will. You understand uh, that the Old Covenant was good, not saying it wasn't good, but the basis of that Old Covenant was to reveal sin so man in the revelation of his own sin could cast himself down at the very mercy of the Lord Jesus himself. Now, let, let me help you with a couple of things that I think may get across the point. When I talk about the law of the Old Testament, I compare that law to a set of scales. Now, I get on scales... And the scales can't do a thing in the world about my weight. They can only bear the bad news. Are y'all tracking with me? Don't laugh too much at that because I will take it personal. But it, it, it just bears the bad news. Can't do anything about the problem. It just reveals the problem. Now, one other analogy and I'll go on. Some of you are relate. Do you know what a dipstick is? Y'all know what a dipstick is? Shake your head like that. I know what a, a, a dipstick. You go out to the hood of your car, raise the hood up, and, and you grab hold of the dipstick, and you pull out the dipstick, and the dipstick reveals that you are a quart low of oil. Now, it can't do anything about the problem that caused it to be a quart low of oil. It just reveals the problem. So that was the law. It could only reveal and announce the sin and reveal it to you so you could be ready for the Savior. If you've ever stopped to think of all of the things that Jesus guarantees in your life, you, you, you see, he guarantees that we're cleansed by sin. He guarantees that once we have turned away from sin, placed our faith in Jesus, he guarantees the forgiveness of our sin. He guarantees his presence in our life that once we turn from sin, place our faith in him, he takes up residence and he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He guarantees us the abundant life. He guarantees us power for daily living for Christ. He guarantees us a peace that the world doesn't know anything about and can't give us. He guarantees us eternal life and on and on and on it goes. So he is a guaranteed priest. I want to talk to you a second or two about the permanent priesthood. Watch beginning in verse 23. 
And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Let me just stop in verse 23. How many of you have gone to a doctor for many, many, many years and suddenly you read in the obituary of the paper or you see it online somewhere that your doctor died? Now all of a sudden that just tears your nerves up. You don't know what to do with that. Kind of discombobulate. What am I going to do now? You understand? So this high priest position on earth what was interrupted time after time after time because of the death of the high priest, they would have to go find another one. All right, verse 24. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. In other words, now Jesus has been made high priest forever and ever. He continues because he's never going to die. All right. I mean, look on now as we go to verse 25. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost. We used to preach years ago, he saved from the guttermost to the uttermost. That come unto God by him, seeing he ever lives to make intercession for them. So he begins verse 25 with the word therefore. He's talking here about a bridge to get our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 25 is an amazing salvation verse. Somehow or other, the Holy Spirit just decides that he's going to drop this salvation verse right in the middle of the description of the priesthood and interrupts that flow for just a minute because he wants to give us the theme of the priesthood is Jesus and Jesus is the theme of salvation. It's a salvation verse. It tells us who he is. Now watch this as we go to number five. He is a capable priest. When I read verse 25, there, there are about five things that jump out at me. I want to read them very carefully. First of all, I see the power of salvation. He is able. He has the ability. He has the power. He has the authority. He has the right to save. And then I see the purpose of salvation. It tells us really here why he came. He didn't come here to make the world a better place. He didn't come here to knock the dents out of your life. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And then fourth, I see the people of salvation. Those who come to God by faith. And then finally, I see the perseverance of salvation. The Bible says he always lives. He lives forever to intercede. Now, why is it that you can be assured that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? Why is it that you can have the assurance that your sins have been forgiven forever, that you're on your way to heaven? Nothing can ever stop that. May I say to you, the reason that you can have that assurance is because the Lord Jesus Christ is there at the right hand of the throne of God and the Bible says he's interceding for you and for me forever and ever. Now, verse 26, and, and boy, this gets a little bit disturbing here. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needs not daily, as those high priests offer up sacrifice, first for their own sins, and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself once once you don't have to continue going to mass and crucifying afresh and anew week after week after week and killing Jesus it, 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 it's, it's somehow or other we've got this idea that the blood of Jesus Christ was good enough to take and powerful enough to take care of my past sins. But the blood of Jesus Christ is not powerful enough to take care of my present and my future sins. And so I have to go somehow on a weekly basis and make penance for my sins. It's the idea of purgatory that people die 
and somehow they get into purgatory because they're there because they died with sin and those sins have to be redeemed. Those sins have to be paid for and the only way they can get out of purgatory is somebody to pay. Let me tell you, the word of God is clear and plain that he died once for all. Well, I got lost in my place here. Hang on a minute. Verse 28. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Now, let me finish with this. We have an effective high priest. An effective high priest. Watch chapter 8, verse 1. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A couple of things jump out. First of all, you notice Jesus sat down. The, the, the Levitical priests never sat down. Do you know why? Their work was never perfected. Their work was never completed. When Jesus cried from the cross. It's finished. He sat down not because he was tired, but because he was done. He had completed it. He had finished what God had given him to do. Now, watch verse 2. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. What's he talking about? Well, he's not talking about that mobile tabernacle that moved around periodically in the Old Testament. He's not talking about Solomon's temple. He's talking about a spiritual sanctuary, a spiritual tabernacle that surrounds the Lord Jesus as he is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God in glory, interceding uh, for us. Now look at verse 3. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Let me give you the difference. This is worth the price of admission. Let me give you the difference between the Levitical priests and Jesus as the high priest. The Levit Levitical priests offered up the blood of goats and calves and all kind of animals. Jesus offered up himself. He became our high priest, the sacrificer. Don't even know if that's a word or not, but it sounds pretty good. The sacrificer became the sacrifice. Verse 4. For if he were on the earth, he should not be a high priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. What's he saying? Jesus was not qualified to be the high priest while he was on earth. You know why? Because the high priest, first thing he had to do was he had to offer up sacrifices for his own sin. And since Jesus didn't have any sin, that's one of the reasons he was not qualified to be the high priest. Verse 5, who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Uh, you see, the, the Lord Jesus' priesthood did not kick in until he was in heaven itself, where he sat down and is making intercession for you and me. So Jesus came to do what God had in mind the first place, and that was to make it possible for you and me and for all mankind to have access personally to God. May I say to you that he, and I'll say it again as I said, he is the only genuine, real, bona fide means by which any of us are able to have access to God. It's in Jesus. So he became the great replacement. No longer do we have to go through any man to have access to God because we have a high priest in heaven 
Jesus that gives us the ability to get to God. Would you stand with me and let's pray together, please? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many of you could honestly, genuinely, and sincerely say, Mike, I have a relationship with God through Christ. There's been a day in my life that I asked the Lord Jesus to forgive me of my sin. And I received him into my heart and into my life. And I have the assurance that when I die, I'm going to go to heaven because I've gained access to God through Jesus Christ. Would you hold your hand up just a minute, Pastor? I, I do. I have him in my heart. Just leave it up for a minute. Leave it up for a minute. Leave it up for a minute. All right. The overwhelming majority of the people in the room could lift their hand. But you know, unfortunately, just like in the last service, there's some who could not raise their hand. I, Pastor, I don't remember ever having a time like that in my life. I wish you could have been here a minute ago when a young man about 17 years old by the name of Matthew. And a young man looked like maybe he was about 30 years old by the name of Paul. Two good Bible names. Didn't raise their hand, couldn't raise their hand. But oh, by the time they left here, they could. Here's why. They admitted that their sin had separated them from God. They realized that the only way they were ever going to see God was that they had to turn from their sin, place their faith and their trust in Jesus, and let him be the Lord of their life. You say, Pastor, I'd like to do that. I, I just don't know how. I, I, don't, I don't want to leave here today without knowing that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I don't want to leave here today without my sins being forgiven and cleansed that I would be right with God when I left. If that's your desire, would you pray something like this with me? Right where you're standing, would you just call out to God with something like this? Just make this your prayer. This prayer can't save you. I can't save you. Only Jesus can save you. But would you pray something like this to him? Heavenly Father, you can pray it out loud or you can pray it in your heart of hearts. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died on a cross for my sin. And I know that I'm a sinner. Today, Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me of all my sin. Today I turn away from sin. And with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Right now I receive you into my heart and into my life. Change me. Save me. Make me new. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.